I'm happy to be here this morning and start this workshop off. Um, as Monique said, I've been involved with horses for a very long time and with contraception for a very long time. And I think it would be wonderful if uh, we could bring all of this together so at least some of the um, feral horse, wild horse herds could be better managed with fertility control. Uh, let's see. So why do we need a workshop since this has been going on for decades from some people's points of view? And John Turner, I saw earlier, there he is. The earliest paper I could find out of uh, the lab uh, for you and Jay was in 1982. I don't know if there was an earlier one, but it means we're going back decades in efforts to contracept uh, wild horses. Uh, and yet, despite all of that effort and all that time and the intervening studies, very few of those populations are actually receiving uh, fertility control for management. So one of the things this workshop is going to do is look at where those, the log jams are, where the problems might be. Um, and so this, I guess the challenge you could say began in 1971 uh, with the Wild Horse and Burrow Act, and it specifically states that horses and burrows on federal land can't be harassed or killed, and the Bureau of Land Management was made responsible then for managing them. And there's a long history before and quite a bit since, but I only have 15 minutes, so you're just getting the, the quick overview. Uh, and then in 1978, the adoption program began, which for quite a while was surprisingly successful and um, managed to be able to place most of the horses that were being gathered from the range when the population would exceed the numbers, the levels that had been set. There's also controversy about those levels, but that's for a different workshop. We're talking about fertility control. Uh, so the National Academy of Sciences has had actually four committees. The first three uh, were 19, had reports uh, published in 1980, 1982, and 1991, and all of them looked at fertility control as an option. Are you still hearing me through this because it's sounding different to me? Can you hear me? In fact, they're probably videotaping it, which is why they need me to use this, because otherwise I have a very loud voice and can speak without a microphone. Um, but uh, so starting all the way back in 1980 with that first committee, there were reviews of the, the likelihood or possibility for using fertility control and recommendations for more research and for implementation. And full disclosure, this was the... Uh, you have to take my word for it, that really is me, <laughs> doing a vasectomy of a stallion out in the field in Nevada. Uh, so I have a, a personal interest in this going back a long time. I spent two years after that then following those bands around to look at efficacy. Um, but um, fast forward, and this is a graph that was given to the committee uh, that I was on uh, earlier this decade, looking at horse numbers over time, and it really is revealing and sobering, especially when you focus on those bars that are going up. Those are the numbers of horses in long-term holding, meaning horses that are gathered from the range, can't find adoption homes, and the government is then responsible for maintaining them until they die. And doing a good job means they live a long time. And <clears throat> at the time of this graph being produced in 2012, you can see the line of number of horses in the range dipping below the number of horses in long-term holding. So this is a problem and is unsustainable. Um, so even before 2012, the Senate, um, in the, the US Senate recognized this budgetary challenge that was happening with uh, BLM's horse program and ordered them to prepare a new comprehensive long-term plan. So uh, among the things that BLM did was to commission another uh, National Academy of Sciences committee, but this committee, and this is the one that I served on, wasn't asked to design new studies, but to do a thorough review 
of all the studies that had been published, uh, the previous reports that came out of NAS, and we brought in people to our meetings who were currently involved in studies that weren't yet published. So we would have the latest information. Uh, so it was convened in 2011, and oh, I just said this, let me skip ahead then. Um, so the chapters in the report uh, covered not just fertility control, but looked carefully also at census methods. And it turns out that census methods weren't consistent across the herd management areas. And so the numbers were questionable. And so one of the recommendations was for how new and updated census methods might be implemented. Also looking carefully at genetic diversity across the populations and a lot of population modeling look at looking at trajectories. If you're going to use fertility control, what percentage of a herd do you need to be able to successfully treat to actually affect population numbers? Social considerations is really important because this, as I would suspect all of you know, <laughs> all of you in this room, is a very contentious topic. There are people who have very diverging opinions about horses, their value, and how they should be treated and how they should be managed. And that's something that BLM and all of us need to recognize and take into consideration. Um, and then uh, we also looked at methods for uh, possibly adjusting the appropriate um, management levels, like the number of animals in each of the herd areas. But since we're focusing on fertility control, uh, these are the criteria that my subgroup looked at. So of course, efficacy, how long it's effective, but also uh, is the product uh, available to the extent that it could be used, could be implemented, there's enough of it uh, on the market. The delivery method, uh, how, is it, how are you gonna get it into the horses and is that going to be efficient? And then of course, side effects. Uh, we want something of course that's safe um, but also uh, something that's emerged as being important, especially through public comment, is that the behavioral system of those uh, herds be, of the bands be maintained. Uh, the three methods that we ended up, glean as we gleaned through the, the literature and the reports, of course, PZP products, the most experience we have, and actually during the time the committee was convening, uh, the PZP product uh, out of the Kirkpatrick and Turner labs uh, uh, got EPA approval uh, for use and so became even more available. Uh, and that was with Humane Society help. Uh, Gonacon showed a lot of promise, although there wasn't nearly enough research yet. And we even looked at male directed because that kept coming up as uh, being valuable in some areas, and we did population modeling with it, and if used properly, it can be effective. But instead of surgical vasectomy, like we used way back in the 80s, uh, to use chemical vasect vasectomy instead, because that's faster and safer. Um, but since the report, um, and we'll be hearing about these, I'm hoping, in the next uh, in, uh, hours today, is that even more um, methods are starting to show up as fertility control is becoming uh, of interest to m a wider number of species and groups, so there's more research. But the main committee conclusions is basically that business as usual for BLM to keep managing horses as they do, which is gathering horses off the range, putting some of them up for adoption, and a they gather between about five and 10,000 a year, but the program seems to be saturated so that only about 2,000 per year get adopted. So of course, there's a big surplus then. That's not sustainable, uh, especially given uh, what we calculated to be the growth rate of the population. Reproductive rates are really high, in particular because the ecologists believe, and this is not my specific area of expertise, but the way horses are being managed now would be maximal harvest method. That as you take animals off, you leave better habitat behind, less competition for new animals being born, so you get higher recruitment in the ones that, re recruitment meaning 
youngsters born and surviving than you would get if you just left those animals out there. So you're actually producing more horses with the current method. Um, warehousing horses in these long-term um, facilities is not economically sustainable, and Congress has told BLM this can't continue. There has to be an alternative. And of course, uh, the public is concerned about uh, the animals being kept that way. That's not the original intent of the Wild Horse, Horse and Burrow Act. Wild Horse Annie did not imagine horses being brought into long-term holding. She imagined them free on the range. Uh, so uh, the way things are going now really need to take a different direction. And of, of the, the the basic points coming out of that report is that fertility control research and implementation are recommended to manage free roam, roaming horses and burrows. And also recognizing and stating, I, I hope clearly, methods are already in place to do that. They may not be ideal, but uh, at least in some areas, more of that could be done. More fertility control could be implemented. Uh, the picture on the right is the cover of the report, and you can get it at www.nap, National Academies Press, um, .edu. So what's missing? Um, we're wondering, like, are managers waiting for a magic bullet? I would say that's not going to happen. Uh, we need to figure out how to, how to work with what we've got, and we should always be improving what we've got but we can't wait and wait and wait for the magic bullet. Uh, there are delivery uh, and application challenges getting to those animals. That's something else where time and effort and money needs to be spent to work out ways to get fertility drugs into those animals. And so this workshop, we hope, will address some of these points. Uh, so we'll have updates on methods because there has been active research in the last few years. And in fact, BLM had a request for proposal and uh, some projects. I haven't seen the list of all the projects that got funded, but BLM has been putting some research money into this. Uh, also, strategies for implementation, that getting the treatment to the animals. And then where do we still need uh, research? Where are the holes? Where are the gaps? Which products still need further development? So we're hoping we'll come out of this day with some answers. And I want to again recognize and thank uh, our host and organizer, the Bot Steeper Institute. And as Stephanie and um, Monique said earlier, this kind of workshop is exactly the kind of thing they want to do, part of their mission, to bring together people with diverse opinions and with information, to share that information, in what we hope will be a constructive way uh, so that we can find some way to move forward. As the NAS <laughs> report said, the subtitle was A Way Forward, we hope, with fertility control. Thank you.